talked about life and the definition of living things, and we talked a lot about the process of science. And then you got to analyze some scientific data, actually, as part of the quiz. So hopefully you can see that the things that you're learning in here do have some real life applications. All right. I tell you, some days are better than others. Let's try something else. Nope, that's the right way. <laughs> so the battery's dead. All right. <laughs> we can adjust. All right. So today we're going to talk about kind of the chemistry that underpins living things. And some of it might seem like, oh my gosh, this has no relevance to anything at all. But actually, it's going to become very clear as we study some of the body systems later on. Some of these things are actually really quite important. And having a good foundational understanding of them now will help us later when we start to talk about them. All right, so a few other things before we get started. So on the quiz, right, so I asked you your opinion about cahoots, and I didn't have a chance to go through them all before today, so there's no cahoots today, I'm sorry to say. Um, but it's looking so far like people are like, yeah, let's do it. It mixes things up, and I don't blame you at all. So we'll probably do that. But it takes me time to go in and manually enter the points for those. So just so you know, the score that you see right now is not your final quiz score. It will often take me kind of through the week to get those done. So anytime there's text entry questions or things I need to grade manually, just be patient. Um, I, a lot of quizzes get submitted to me on Sunday nights, and I have um, busy Mondays and Tuesdays, so it takes me a while to get to, get to them. Um, so... Thank you, Liam, for pointing out that, you know, the crazy thing about humans is a lot of times we're not aware of our own kind of assumptions and preconceived biases. So the question where I asked you to tell me about potential differences in the two groups between the hydroxychloroquine and the non-hydroxychloroquine patients um, kind of showed one of my inherent biases. So for somebody my age and in general when we're looking at the medical literature, Ages 18 to 44 is considered young. So those are the young people. But then as was pointed out to me, if you're 20 years old, 44 doesn't seem so young. And it's like, well, what did, they were all grouped together. How am I supposed to say who had more 18-year-olds and who had more 40-year-olds? So that was my error in writing the question and not giving you the information that you needed to be able to interpret it appropriately. So if you missed points because you didn't say yes, the people in the hydroxychloroquine group were younger in general than those in the other group, I will go through and manually adjust those points. Right? That was my bad. So as we continue, right, these things crop up from time to time. right? So if you see something where you're like, I don't see how I was supposed to answer that question. <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me. Let me know. All right. Any other questions about the quiz? Yeah. Oh, so middle age is kind of 40 to 60. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so when we're talking about COVID specifically, Old is, you know, older people are 65 and up. That's when we start to really see a change in how people do with an infection, right? Not that young people can't and don't get really sick with COVID, uh, but it's much less common, right? We start to see a real inflection around age 65. So anybody under age 65 is generally considered young. And you're like, my teacher is not young. But yes, I am medically. Medically, I am young, right? I'm young at heart, so... All right. Other questions? All right. All right. Those are young people. Um, so, you know, I kind of freaked out a little bit last week, and I'm still kind of freaking out because um, our COVID numbers are going up uh, pretty significantly, like we might expect. Um, and I can tell you that the cases that we're diagnosing at Student Health Services are people who've had unmasked contact with other people, right? So it's roommates and boyfriends and the boyfriends of roommates and um, having a small group of people over for drinks or dinner, right? Um, that unmasked contact is what seems to be driving a lot of what we're seeing. Uh, Lacrosse has gone into a shutdown for the next two weeks and all their classes are online. 
Um, Madison is online for two weeks, so oh, I hope we don't get there, but you know, so do what you can. There's only so much you can do, right, if you live in a house with four other people, but do what you can, please. All right, so we're going to talk about bonding today, right? So we're talking chemistry. Unfortunately, we're ta talking about bonding rituals. We're not talking about how to bond with other people. We're going to talk about how atoms bond together to form molecules. So let's get started with that. So there's three main types of bonds that we're going to talk about, and we're going to talk about each one in turn, ionic, covalent, and hydrogen. So you probably learned this, you hopefully learned this in high school chemistry. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but there's good information in the book if you need it. So we have to understand why do bonds even happen, right? Why do atoms choose to bond to other atoms to form molecules? And it's because of this weird thing with electrons. So you remember these electron shells making these little models of atoms in your chemistry class. And so atoms don't like to have an outermost shell that is not completely full. So they either want it completely full or they want it empty. So if we look at the atom on the left, this is a sodium atom. And we can see, because it has 11 electrons, you might remember two are in the innermost shell, and then eight are in the outer one. And then we have one lonely little electron in the outermost shell. He is super unhappy there, OK? It's no good. If we look at chlorine, right? So 17 electrons, so you've got two, and then you've got eight, and then you've got seven. He's like, oh, if only I could have one more electron. Right? So in this case, sodium is going to say, you know what, I have one, I don't even really want it anyway. And chlorine is going to say, well, yes, thank you, I will take that. Right? And they're going to form an ionic bond. So if we look over on the right side here, so our sodium is going to give an electron to chlorine. Electrons are negatively charged. So that becomes a chloride ion. An ion is a charged particle. Right? Because it gained an electron, electrons have a negative charge, that chloride ion now has a negative charge. The sodium lost an electron, so it now has a positive charge. So they're happy because their outermost shell is filled, but now I have one that has a positive charge and one that has a negative charge, and what do opposites do? They attract, okay? So now because they're charged, now they slam up against each other. That's an ionic bond, right? So we gave an electron to somebody else. Now we're each ions. We have a charge, so we get stuck together. Covalent bonds are different. Covalent bonds are, well, I really wish, so we, here we have an oxygen and two hydrogens. And you can see the oxygen there in its outermost shell, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, right? Its inner shell has two. So it has six, but it really wants eight because that's what atoms want. They want eight, OK? So it really wants eight. And the hydrogens over here, they each have one in that innermost shell. They really want two. So they strike a deal. They say, all right, let's go have these. I'll share with you, right? So instead of just giving it, you can share. And they kind of part-time hang out with the hydrogen, and they part-time hang out with the oxygen, and that forms water. And everybody's happy. So that's a covalent bond. Covalent bond is where they share electrons, OK? So we don't have ions. They're just sharing. It's like joint custody, so you have to live in the same time, OK? All right. Sorry, I love really cheesy jokes. So two atoms are talking. One of them says, I think I've lost an electron. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm positive. OK. <laughs> All right, so water, I just mentioned, has covalent bonds between the oxygen and the two hydrogens. And lots of the molecules that we're going to be looking at today have covalent bonds. In fact, most of them do, and that's how they join together. But water also has some other special properties. And so we're going to talk about why water is so special. And this is the reason why we are water-based organisms, right? I am not diesel-based, right? I am not oil-based. We use water, right? We are all gooey. We are like more than 70% water because water is super cool. So we have this covalent bond. Now, if you think about atomic structure, you might remember that oxygen has eight protons. They're positively charged. 
each hydrogen has one proton positively charged. So the electrons are going to end up spending more time over towards the oxygen. Right? It's like shared custody, but they'd rather be at dad's house because he has Netflix. Right? So they're going to spend a little bit more time over near the oxygen atom. So because of that, that part of the molecule, that part of a water molecule, is going to have a slightly negative charge. Not totally negative charge, right? You didn't lose the electrons. They're just spending more time in one place than another. So that slight negative charge over on the oxygen side, and then a slight positive charge over on the hydrogen side. I just think water molecule kind of looks like Mickey Mouse, which makes me happy. All right. <laughs> so this slight positive and slight negative charges means then, which is often kind of designated with this squiggly Greek symbol, means that some parts, right, the slightly positive parts of one atom are then going to be attracted to the slightly negative parts of another atom. So when we have molecules of water all together, the different molecules are going to kind of start to be attracted a little bit towards each other because of these partial charges. These are called hydrogen bonds. So when we have a cup full of water, all of those H2O molecules they kind of stick to each other because these areas that are partially positive charged and partially negative charged. So that's going to result in a lot of interesting behavior that we don't see in other types of liquids necessarily. So one is the fact that water is even a liquid anyway. Normally, a molecule that is so small like water should be a gas. It should be light and it should just be dispersed out in the atmosphere, right? So if you look at these other molecules, right? So hydrogen gas, methane gas, oxygen gas, they're gases because they're tiny. But water, even though it's tiny, because they all like to clump together, it's a liquid at room temperature. That's unusual. That's special. The other thing about water, because it likes to stick together, is it can absorb a lot of heat energy. So it has a really high, what's called specific heat or thermal capacity. You know this if you've ever tried to boil water on the stove. It takes forever. It takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of water. Because temperature, and this is kind of weird and like feels metaphysical, is actually the kinetic energy of the individual molecules. So if you think about all the individual molecules in water, it's like they kind of all like to hold hands with each other. They like to stick with each other. And you can't be running around if you're kind of holding hands with each other. So it takes a lot to get water up to temperature. It also takes a lot for water to lose its heat. So that's why, for example, you can take a human being and plunk them in an ice bath Right? And unless you keep them in there for quite some time, they're not going to get hypothermia. Right? So water is really good for thermal regulation, better than alcohol. Right? You can heat up some alcohol really quickly. Right? So that's a cool property of water. The other thing, because these molecules like to stick to each other, they're what we call cohesive. They have a high surface tension. So what we see here in the middle image is that's a penny, and somebody has placed a drop of water on top of it. And look at that. It's defying gravity. I won't sing. It's defying gravity, all right? We have that kind of bubble of water because they want to stick together so much, right? Look at here with the paper clip. They want to stick together so much. The paper clip, even though it's heavier than the water, it won't fall down through. So that surface tension, because it's cohesive, it also still flows freely, which is really nice. So water becomes a really useful kind of base, you know, substance for our bloodstream because it's going to fill blood vessels really well. Right. Another thing about water is it is really, really good at dissolving things that are what we call polar. So polar means it has a charge, right? So there's one part of the molecule that's kind of positive, one part of the molecule that's kind of negative, right? So what molecule have we talked about already today that is a polar molecule and, in fact, is 
a molecule that uses an ionic bond. Yeah, so sodium chloride, which is table salt, right? It's really easy to dissolve salt in water, right? It's really a good solvent. It's very good at dissolving things that are polar, that have an inherent slight positive or very positive or negative charge to them. What kinds of things is water not good at dissolving? What kinds of things don't mix in well? Yes, then. Oil, absolutely. So oil is nonpolar. It doesn't have any charged parts. So oil does not dissolve in water. So we use specific terms for this. Hydro means water, philic means loving. So hydrophilic things are things that dissolve in water. Things that dissolve in water are polar. That's why they dissolved in water in the first place. Hydrophobic, phobic means afraid of. Those things don't dissolve in water because they are not polar. Right? So fats and oils, they're nonpolar. So if you're going to make a good cheese sauce, you have to put in something called an emulsifier, like some flour, or else you just get oil on top, and ugh, it's no good. All right? So hydrophilic versus hydrophobic. All right. Any questions about water before we move on to acids and bases? All right. So acids, they have some things in common, whether they are strong acids or whether they are weak acids. Their pH, here's our pH scale here. Neutral is seven, water is neutral. Acids have a pH of less than seven. They taste sour. Are those lab kits? Awesome, we can just leave them in the back. Thank you so much. They taste sour, which you know if you know, so tomatoes have a mildly sour taste, but vinegar, which is even more acidic, tastes more sour, right, like your pickles. And then lemons are very sour because they are even more acidic. The lower the pH, the more acidic something is. The farther away from seven, right, if it's less than seven, the more acidic it is. Bases have a pH greater than seven, they tend to feel kind of slippery. So if you've ever had some bleach that you got on your hand, which please wash it off right away, <laughs> right? But soap, right, ammonia, they have kind of a slippery feeling to them. Semen is basic, it's alkaline, has kind of a slippery feel, kind of a soapy taste, most things that are basic. And they can be toxic to cells if they're strong, just like acids can, right? Either of them can be really toxic if they're too strong. I mean, it's like, well, why is that, right? Like, what's going on chemically that makes them potentially damaging to other molecules? So it happens to be that acids are molecules, substances that happen to have a lot of extra hydrogen ions around. And hydrogen ions have a positive charge. And so they're gonna wanna steal an electron because that electron is gonna help them balance out their charge. Hydrogen ions are also really tiny. They're basically just protons. They're really tiny. So it's really easy for them to get into a molecule and grab electrons, right? And that molecule, like, had an understanding with another, right? There's a couple atoms, like, they were either in a covalent bond or they were an ionic bond, right? They had an understanding. And now you go and you start stealing away electrons. That's going to mess everything up. Molecular mayhem, okay? Bases... On the other hand, look at this. They have a lot of what are called hydroxide ions. And if you look at that, you'll see that's the other half of water. Hydroxide ions want to give away electrons. They have this negative charge. They want to get rid of it. So they're going to sneak up to a molecule and stick an electron in there and disrupt the bonds that already exist. Okay, so both acids and bases can be very disruptive if they're strong enough, right? And what makes something a stronger acid is that it has more hydrogen ions. What makes something a strong base is that it has more hydroxide ions. All right, so we are gonna watch a little clip of sulfuric acid, which is a very strong acid. 
being poured onto a roll of toilet paper. You can find lots of different um, videos of sulfuric acid being poured on various things, but I figured this is kind of the year of the toilet paper. So let's watch what happens when I add a crap ton of protons that are going to steal electrons away from my molecules. Ah, it's not looking so good. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, now it's really not looking good, right? <laughs> ah! <laughs> right? So look at all this devastation because we are stealing electrons, right? We're totally breaking apart those molecular bonds. So I think it goes without saying you don't want to accidentally spill sulfuric acid on you, right? Because you know what? You're actually made out of a lot of the same molecules, believe it or not, that are some similar molecules that the uh, toilet paper is made out of. All right. <laughs> you can find lots of fun things like this on the internet. All right. So now let's see. All right, so as I mentioned, there's four types of organic molecules. We're going to talk about them one in order, so you don't need to write them down right now. Carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. So cool things about organic molecules. They are only found in living things and viruses. Those little pesky, not quite living, sort of living things, right? They contain mostly carbon and hydrogen. So if you read sci-fi or anything, you're like, we are a carbon-based life form. Yes, we are. We're mostly made out of carbon. Most of us is carbon and some hydrogen. And they're made up of subunits, like beads on a string, or like, you know those little like pop-em things that you would play with when you were a toddler, right? And you can hook a whole bunch of them together and have a big, long string of them. All of our organic molecules are made of subunits that are then joined together or can be split apart, okay? So how do we do that? There we go. So each one of these little round things is a subunit. And you can see I've got a kind of a bunch of subunits linked together. That's my short polymer. And I have one little subunit by itself. That's the monomer. And you see I've got a hydroxide and a hydrogen there. And I can pull that H and that OH out, form a molecule of water, and then that creates a need for a bond between my subunits. Or I can take a water add it into one of those bonds and split it up and break apart the subunits. So we give this special names depending on what we're doing. Right? So when I'm linking them together by taking away a few atoms from one and the other and making it into a water molecule, that is called dehydration synthesis. If you think about it, dehydration, I'm taking water out. Synthesis putting together. Okay? So dehydration synthesis reaction is how we link subunits together to form organic molecules. If I eat some organic molecules, which is mostly what we eat, then I want to break them down into their subunits. And so to go the opposite way, that's called hydrolysis. Again, hydro meaning water, lysis means splitting. We'll see that again when we talk about how sometimes when cells break apart. We call that lysis also. So hydrolysis is adding a water molecule to split the subunits apart. So this is going to apply to all four types of organic molecules. Let's talk about carbohydrates first. And let's look at that word, carbohydrates. Now, because of their kind of popular usage, when you hear carb, you think carbs, which is referring to carbohydrates. But it actually comes from carbon, and then hydrate, water. So carbohydrates are made up of a lot of carbon, so you can see kind of on the right here, with a lot of basically water molecules attached to either side of them. So that's where the name comes from. 
So there are these long strings of things that then form their subunit, which is a saccharide, which is the technical term for a sugar, which is a ring of these carbons with little H's and OH's on either side of them. So the subunit of a carbohydrate, this is the take home point, the subunit of a carbohydrate is a saccharide, which is a sugar, okay? And we're gonna link those together. So perhaps you have heard some of these terms, monosaccharides, disaccharides, or polysaccharides. You probably, if you haven't heard that term, you've probably heard simple versus complex carbohydrates. Okay. So the simple ones are the mono and the disaccharides that have only one sugar subunit or two sugar subunits linked together. A complex is a polysaccharide, it has multiple subunits linked together. So some examples of simple carbohydrates, those mono and disaccharides. Monosaccharides would include glucose, right? That is the primary form of sugar that circulates in our bloodstream. We have to regulate that very, very closely. So that's another important thing for homeostasis. So our blood sugar is glucose. Fructose, which is what makes fruits taste sweet, Right? That's the sugar that's naturally present in fruits. That is a monosaccharide. It just has one subunit. We're very familiar with some disaccharides. So sucrose, which is table sugar, what we think of as sugar, right? That one is actually a disaccharide. It's a glucose plus a fructose joined together by, what's the process called? When we take the water out to combine things together, we call it dehydration synthesis. Yes. Okay, so we can put those two together and make table sugar. And we can digest it when we eat it by performing hydrolysis and breaking it into its subunits. Lactose is also a disaccharide. And when we eat it, right, so that's the um, sugar that's normally found in milk. When we eat it in order to help us do that hydrolysis, we need an enzyme called lactase. And some of us don't have it. And those are the people who are lactose intolerant. They can't properly digest it unless they take lactase enzyme. Right? That's what lactate is, the tablets. Right? So you can actually eat the enzyme to allow you to digest it. All right. So those are simple carbohydrates, just some examples. Complex carbohydrates, there are three main types. So I want to draw your attention to the diagram. So animals, we are animal. We only produce one type of complex carbohydrate in our bodies, which is glycogen. That is our storage form of sugar. So if you've ever done a carb load before a big race or a big athletic event where you just ate a ton of carbs, right? So you took in a ton of saccharide subunits. What your body did was you broke them down so you could absorb them. And then you packed them into these branched chains of glycogen and stored them in your liver for ready access. It's kind of like putting them in the pantry for when you need them later, for when you're peckish and you need a snack, right? So animals, we make glycogen. Plants can make two different types of complex polysaccharides, which is great for us because we eat them, all right? So they can make starch. Right? Starch is, let's see all those little saccharide subunits kind of together like that. And starch is how they store energy. So it's a great energy source for us when we eat it. Right? So if you're eating whole grains or if you're eating a banana, right, or things like that that are complex carbohydrates, you are eating starches. Right? Good sources, you're eating pasta. Good sources of lots of saccharide subunits. Now cellulose is different. Cellulose is how you, trees make bark, right? Cellulose is how you make structural things. It's using sugar subunits, saccharide subunits, to make something that's rigid and hard and strong, right? So plants can make cellulose, we don't make cellulose, um, and we can't digest it. So gnawing on tree bark is not gonna get you very far in life. All right, so there's the two and there's the one that we can't digest. All right, next. So, so far we've just talked about the first category of organic molecules. We've talked about carbohydrates. 
Now we're going to talk about the second one, lipids. Lipids are our fats and our oils. There are also some other types of lipids, but they all have a few things in common. They are all nonpolar, which means by default that they are hydrophobic. They do not dissolve well in water. So all lipids are hydrophobic, all lipids are nonpolar. They also have mostly just carbon and hydrogen. They don't have a lot of oxygen like the carbohydrates did. Mostly just carbon and hydrogen. And what's cool about that is because the way they're constructed, they contain a ton of energy. So they are more energy dense than any of the other types of molecules. Right? So if you want to take in a lot of calories, calories are the unit of heat energy that you can get from a food, you're going to eat something really fatty. Okay? if you want to eat the smallest volume with the greatest payoff in terms of the most energy. So lipids are really useful that way. It's a really um, efficient way to store a lot of energy in a small place. The subunits for lipids are fatty acids plus some stuff or carbon rings. So it's a little different depending on what types of lipids we're talking about, and we'll get into that in a second. And so there are four main groups, so there's four main subgroups of lipids. So we're going to talk about them one by one. You don't need to write them down right now. But they're fats and oils, waxes, phospholipids, and steroids. So we're going to start with the first one. Fats and oils. You know these. We eat these, right? So you're very familiar with these. So fats, by definition, they are solid at room temperature. That's kind of how we distinguish one from the other. They are solid at room temperature. They are usually of animal origin, right? So lard is solid at room temperature. Butter is solid at room temperature, right? So they're usually things that are produced by animals. They're usually saturated fats. And that has to do with their chemical structure. They have as much hydrogen in them as possible. It makes them rigid. That's why they are solid at room temperature, generally. And their functions, right? So this whole energy and nutrient storage, absolutely. It's a great way to store energy. When we, made, so when we eat them, we can get a lot of energy out of them. We can also get some important nutrients from them. When we make them, when our body makes fat, right? We're doing it to store energy, right? So I ate some extra ice cream today, put some away for tomorrow in case it's a lean day, right? So energy storage. It also helps insulate us against heat loss, right? So the more subcutaneous fat, the more fat you have underneath the surface of your skin, the better able you are to withstand colder temperatures, right? It's like a built-in blanket. That's really useful for us. It also provides a protective cushion. So it's interesting, in elderly people, we want them to have some uh, fat on their hips because actually it turns out it protects them from a hip fracture if they fall. We also, all of you right now, have a fatty cushion around your heart. And it's normal, right? I know it doesn't sound like a good thing, right? But it's normal and it's necessary, right? Because if I go like this, right, which we do so often in life, but anyway, right, so if I go like this, Right? My heart is right behind my rib cage. Can you imagine if your heart had no cushioning, which is boom, boom, boom against the inside of your rib cage all the time? You'd bruise your heart. So we actually have a fatty, fatty covering to protect the outside of our heart. We also have a ton of it around our kidneys to hold them in place and to cushion them. Right? So super important to have enough fat. All right, oils are usually liquid at room temperature because they are unsaturated, usually made by plants. So we don't make them for the most part, but we eat them and they're a great energy source. All right, so fats and oils are very similar with the exception that usually fats are made by animals and oils are made by plants. All right. So what are their subunits, All right? So both fats and oils are made by taking a glycerol molecule, I won't quiz you on like what that is or the structure, and then attaching it to three fatty acids. And the fatty acids, right, then attach to that glycerol, and there's three of them. And so sometimes these are called triglycerides. So if you've ever had your blood cholesterol checked and they told you what your triglyceride level was, they're actually measuring 
the amount of fats and oils in your blood at that moment. And I can promise you, if you ate a bunch of shrimp the night before, it will be high. <laughs> That's always fun. All right. So those are their subunits. So we have a glycerol and three fatty acids. They are joined together via process called, don't let me down. I know I'm like an idiot up here, but it's called, how do we join subunits together for organic molecules? We take a water out by a process called dehydration synthesis. So everybody just say it out loud, just humor me once, here we go dehydration synthesis. Thank you. Because if you actually say it out loud, it makes your brain like go, oh, maybe we should pay attention and hold on to that for a little bit, right? So dehydration synthesis, right? We take a water molecule out, three in this case, right, to make a triglyceride or to make a fat or an oil. And when we eat one and we want to break it down into its subunits, we're going to do hydrolysis, right? So all of the organic molecules are the same. Dehydration synthesis to link them together, hydrolysis to split them apart. All right, there are three other types of lipids and they're all pretty specialized. So we're gonna talk about what they do and what they are. Phospholipids, super duper important. So this looks scary and chemistry-like, but hang with me. So they're pretty similar to fats and oils with an exception. So they have a glycerol, just like fats and oils, and two fatty acids, okay? So it's like, oh, it's kind of just the same, except two instead of three fatty acids. Then the piece de, la, de la resistance that I can't even talk about, right? The thing we're gonna add then is a phosphate group, hence phospholipids. So we're gonna add this phosphate group up on the top. And the reason why this is important is that phosphate group is actually polar. It has a slight charge to it. And the fatty acid tails or chains that are on the other end, as you know, are nonpolar, right? So phospholipids are a unique type of lipid because they are not entirely nonpolar, right? They have a part of them that is polar. So we have this phosphate head shown here in the blue and then these nonpolar tails, right? Those fatty acid tails. So it's kind of like a chimera. You have two different things together. And what's cool about that, right, is you can do a lot of different things with it. And what we do with it in our bodies is we use this. This is the primary component of our cell membranes, which are called plasma membranes. So if I look at the membrane that surrounds each one of my cells, what I will see is that membrane is composed of these phospholipids arranged in this specific pattern. We call it a phospholipid bilayer. Bilayer just meaning it's two layers, right? So I have one layer of phospholipids all with their heads up and their tails down. And then right underneath it, like a sandwich, I have a whole layer of phospholipids with their heads down and their tails up, right? It's like two pieces of bread, if the bread is the phosphate heads, and then you put butter on it for the lipid, the fatty acid tails, and you stick it together. So this structure gives us a lot of unique functionality in terms of how we can move things in and out of cells. And we'll talk about that more on Thursday. So phospholipids are super duper important for all animals, including us. This is just another diagram that shows you, right? So we have these polar or hydrophilic phosphate heads, nonpolar or hydrophobic tails. That's kind of a more savvy representation of what we're gonna get into in more detail next time. So they are super duper important. What about waxes? We make wax, right? Where do you have wax? Right? Right? We make earwax. You might think, well, like, what's so awesome about that? Well, it helps protect and waterproof, right, some things. Earwax is also cool because it actually has things that fight bacteria in it, so please don't clean it out regularly unless you are somebody who makes excessive earwax. Leave it there. Um, we also, when we are little babies inside the womb, when we're in our pregnant mom's belly, we are surrounded by amniotic fluid, right? So we're basically kind of floating in a little 98 degree hot tub. What happens to you if you spend a lot of time in a hot tub? 
you get all wrinkly, right? So fetuses, right, the baby in the womb, they actually make a wax that covers the surface of their skin. It's called vernix. So we actually make a waxy coating that covers the surface of our skin when we're in utero so that we don't get all wrinkly. It's pretty cool. Sometimes you can see it when the baby's born. You can see this kind of waxy coating, especially if they're a little bit premature. They'll have a lot of it on. All right. So waxes, I just want you to know that we have them and that they fall under the subgroup of lipid. They're subunits. They have a fatty acid. And then they usually get hooked up to a long chain alcohol. But I don't care that you know that, right? But I do care that the process of putting those subunits together is called dehydration synthesis. Thank you. See, so if there's one thing you'll remember today, it's dehydration synthesis. And that's all right with me. All right, steroids. This is our last lipid. So we're still under that subcategory of lipids, things that are generally nonpolar. And remember I said usually their subunits are fatty acids, right? And we saw the fats and oils had three fatty acids assigned and attached to a glycerol. The phospholipids had two fatty acids assigned to a phosphate head. Waxes had a fatty acid attached to a long chain alcohol. Well, steroids are the weird ones, okay? They're like totally different. So they're still lipids, however. They're still nonpolar, and they're made mostly of carbon and hydrogen and not much oxygen. But the thing about them is that their subunit, they have four rings of carbon atoms. So when you look at a chemical formula like this, each one of these little points on here is a carbon. So this is a carbon ring. This is a carbon ring, this is a carbon ring, and that's, so you see there's four carbon rings. And then you mix it up a little bit with some bling. You put slightly different molecules over there, you change a bond over here, right? And then you can get different types of things. So this is vitamin D, that's its chemical structure, right? And here we have cholesterol. So they each have these four carbon rings, and then they have special doodads. And that's what makes the difference between one steroid and another steroid. So steroids are super important. We use them in lots of different ways. One example of a steroid is cholesterol. So cholesterol is kind of a fatty thing. It's not technically a fat. It's technically a steroid because it has these four carbon rings. Right? And so if you get your blood cholesterol checked, they can tell you what your total cholesterol is. Now, you might think, well, cholesterol is such a bad thing. It causes hardening of the arteries. It causes heart disease. Yes, that's true if you have too much. But cholesterol also serves several important functions in our bodies. Cholesterol is part of our cell membranes. It is a really important structural component of those plasma membranes that we're going to look at more next time. It's also a molecule that we use as a starter to then create other important things like vitamin D, like testosterone, like estrogen. So the way we make those is we start with a cholesterol molecule and then we start taking off some of the bits and bobs and adding some new ones, okay? So you can see here's kind of the whole process. Cholesterol, right, can be making made into cortisol, which is another hormone, progesterone, or we can make it into this hormone here, which then gets made into testosterone, into testosterone. And then if you have the right body parts, testosterone gets turned into estrogen. That's how we do those chemical reactions in our body. Isn't that weird? So everybody in this room has a lot of estrogen in their system right now. You got it by taking cholesterol turning it into testosterone, and then turning it into estrogen. Isn't that crazy? All right. Now, most of the way you guys hear about steroids is in the anabolic steroids, right? So like steroids in sports, right? Taking things that cause increase in muscle mass. Testosterone will do that, right? That's just an effect of that hormone. And so a lot of the anabolic, which means result in building up of, as opposed to catabolic, which is breaking down, uh, that a lot of the anabolic steroids are chemically related to testosterone, and they have the same types of effects on muscle tissue. So they are also steroids, right? But there's lots of different types of steroids. All right, questions about lipids. So we had the fats and oils, 
we had waxes, we had phospholipids, and we had steroids. Most of you are still awake. That's pretty good. All right, let's talk about proteins. This is like people's favorite. And proteins are kind of my favorite too because they are so amazing. They do so many different things. So we're gonna start by talking about the different things that proteins can do. So some proteins are really important for motion. All right, so if everybody's like, I have to eat protein to build up my muscles. Yes, no, maybe so, but proteins are a really important component of our muscles. So proteins are really important structures that allow us to move. So there are certain proteins called actin and myosin that are in our muscles, and we'll learn about them later this semester in terms of how they make a muscle contract, right? So proteins are really important. They're what allow us to move. So we have proteins that are specifically designed to carry out motion. Some proteins are structural proteins. They actually make structures, parts of us. So keratin is the protein that's in your fingernail in your hair, right, that's made out of keratin. Collagen is a protein that perhaps you've heard of. Collagen is used for tendons and ligaments. It's also used in the tissue in the deep part of your skin. And it's the strength of collagen fibers that prevents, when I go like this, it's because of collagen that my skin doesn't rip open. It's nice and tough and strong, okay? so. Proteins can also be structural proteins that kind of add structure and substance to our body parts. Proteins are also enzymes. So we've already talked about one enzyme today. The enzyme that allows us to do the hydrolysis of lactose, that disaccharide, that allows us to add a water molecule and split it into its subunits, right? So enzymes allow us to carry out chemical reactions that otherwise would not easily occur. And they do that by bringing the components together and holding them near each other. Now, a few things that are really important about enzymes. One is that they're specific. Lactase helps me digest lactose, and that's it. Lactase enzyme is not gonna help me digest anything else. Won't help me digest sucrose, won't help me digest fats, won't help me digest anything else. Enzymes are always specific to a very a certain one type of reaction. The other thing about enzymes is that they function best at specific temperatures. In the case of us, if it's an enzyme that humans have, well, our normal temperature is about 98.6. So most of our enzymes function best at 98.6 degrees or thereabouts. They also only function at a certain pH. So when we do the digestive system, we'll learn about how one of the main reasons that we have stomach acid is to allow certain enzymes to do their job. The acid itself doesn't do much digestion at all, but it allows for the appropriate pH for certain enzymes to do their job. So enzymes are super duper important. Without them, we would be dead. <laughs> we wouldn't be able to do any chemical reactions, right? We need them to help us out. Proteins can also do transport. So the most famous transport protein is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is what's in your red blood cells and it carries oxygen. And when they're carrying oxygen, they are bright red. That is why your blood is red, okay? So hemoglobin, you can see here's our protein. It's this squiggly thing. And that blue dot is an oxygen molecule being carried by that hemoglobin. It's a transport protein. It's specifically designed to carry oxygen around in your bloodstream. Proteins can be our defenders. So antibodies, which you've perhaps heard a lot about during this pandemic. Antibodies, which are ways that we fight infectious agents like viruses or bacteria, they are proteins, right? So antibodies are proteins. Some of our hormones are proteins. And they may be like, wait a minute, wait a minute, Dr. Hall, you just said steroids are hormones, right? Like estrogen and progesterone and testosterone and cortisol, and they are. So we have two different types of hormones. We have steroid hormones that are made of those rings of carbon, and we have peptide or protein hormones. So sometimes when we're talking about prote proteins, you'll hear the word peptide. 
okay? It's referring to the same type of thing. We'll talk about why in a little minute. So insulin, for example, is a really important hormone because it helps us regulate our blood sugar, glucose, that monosaccharide that we talked about earlier, which is super important for homeostasis. If your blood sugar gets too low, you will die. If it gets too high, you will feel really bad, <laughs> right? And you can get really sick. People with diabetes, if it's type 2 diabetes, their blood sugar tends to get too high. People with type 1 diabetes don't have enough insulin, or they don't have any insulin at all. So thank goodness now we have the technology that we can provide them with insulin that they can give by injection or pump. So insulin and growth hormone, which is what made you grow when you were a kid, made you get taller, made your bones get longer, that is a peptide or protein hormone. So proteins can do so many things. I don't even think we're done yet. No, we're not done. <laughs> proteins can also be receptors on cell membranes. So in order for a hormone like insulin to actually get to a cell and send a message to the cell about what needs to happen, there needs to be a receptor on it. Okay? Receptors are proteins. And so not only do we have receptors for all the different types, many of the different types of hormones, like insulin, like growth hormone, we also have receptors for other kinds of hormones. And one of them is called ACE, which stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. Don't worry about that. But the reason why that one is really relevant today is because it just so happens. Remember when we talked about viruses and we talked about how they're not really living things? And so they can't really do anything unless they get inside your cell where they then hijack your own cell's machinery to make more copies of themselves, right? That's how viruses work. The way that the SARS-CoV-2 virus, so the new novel coronavirus that causes COVID, the way that virus gets into your cells, it is able to latch onto a receptor called the ACE2 receptor. And that's how it gets into our cells. So there's a lot of scientists working right now on trying to figure out ways to block that receptor from the virus being able to attach and dock onto it. Question? Nope, stretching? OK, good. Yeah? Right, so, right, because then it's like if we're going to make a drug or something that's going to block that receptor, right, well, what was it normally doing, right? So what might the side effects of that drug be? And that's a really important part of the problem, right? So that receptor, obviously, it has a normal job, which is to normally receive the signal from this hormone called ACE, or angiotensin-converting enzyme, which is important for regulation of blood pressure, right? So in any studies of a drug that's going to interfere with that receptor, they're going to have to watch blood pressure really carefully, okay? Duh, right? It's like, ah, we need that, but it's a vulnerability. Okay. So the other thing that's interesting to me, lots of things are interesting to me, and you're like, Pfft. but they're interesting to me about ACE2, is the types of cells in the body that have a lot of that receptor. Not all of our cells have that receptor because they don't normally need it, right? And some of them have it for reasons where we're not really sure why. <clears throat> for example, the cells in your nose have a lot of ACE2 receptors. So the cells in your nose are especially vulnerable to the SARS-CoV-2 virus for two reasons. One is this virus is floating around in the air and you breathe things into your nose, right? So like one is like that's the first place it lands. But the other is it just happens to be that those cells are especially vulnerable to getting infected by this virus. So that is why also you need to have your mask cover your nose. That is your most vulnerable place. It is also the place, if you are infected and do not realize it, that you have the highest viral loads, right? So walking around with your mask underneath your nose is like walking around with your penis hanging out of your underwear, right? What's the point, <laughs> right? So cover your nose, right? There's also a lot of receptors in the lung, which is why the virus affects the lung so much. And in the heart, we're actually seeing in um, a good proportion of athletes that are getting MRIs and things after even mild cases of COVID that they've got all kinds of inflammation in their hearts. And we don't know yet what that means for them. Like, are they just going to get better from it? Or is it going to always be a problem? We don't know yet, right? So they're trying to figure that out. Okay. 
So receptors are really interesting, and they are proteins too. All right. So what is the structure of proteins, right? So this is an organic molecule. It has a subunit. Subunits are joined together through a process called dehydration synthesis. Thank you. All right. So amino acids look like this. <laughs> Yeah, whatever, right? So they all have the blue and the purple and the green part are always the same. And then the R group literally stands for the rest of the molecule, okay? And the R group is going to be different from one amino acid to the other. There are 20 different amino acids. You don't have to learn them for this class, right? That's for biochemistry. But you can see kind of the part highlighted in that weird greenish color. Those are the R groups. That's what makes one amino acid different from another one, okay? But they all share the rest of the molecule looks exactly the same. All right, so they're linked together via dehydration synthesis, right? And it's called a peptide bond. So remember I mentioned sometimes we use the word peptide and proteins interchangeably. That's called a peptide bond when you do hydrate dehydration synthesis with two amino acids and hook them together. Why do they give it a special name? I don't know. I think just to confuse us. Right? So when you hear peptides, we're talking about proteins. So if you have a couple of just two subunits together, sometimes that's called a peptide or a dipeptide. If you have a lot, like three or more subunits linked together of amino acids, that's called a polypeptide. I don't care that much about that, but if you see that, I want you to know what it means and not be confused. All right. So proteins, oh, I brought a prop for this. They have, the biggest thing about proteins that determines their function is actually their shape. So if you kind of think about like tools in a toolbox, the thing that makes a hammer a hammer and a saw a saw is their physical shape results in very different types of functions that they're able to perform. The same thing is true for proteins. So it's all about what their ultimate physical shape is. So the physical shape of a protein is determined by, first, that sequence of amino acids, all those subunits that you link together. Because they have those R groups, right, the rest of the molecule, the parts that's the bling that's different from one to the other, and those R groups, some of them will have hydrogen bonds to other ones. Some of them will start to form covalent bonds with other ones. So you have this long string, but then they start like trying to hang out with each other and form bonds with each other. So you may have a long string of amino acids, but then they try to like hang out together and form these really interesting structures. So first they form you know, first you have your sequence of amino acids, then they do things like form a helix, right, a spiral, and then they'll do other things like then fold. So because of the different molecular components of amino acids, that is what will make proteins fold into their own unique shape, and it is their shape that gives them their function. So there's a lot of people who are like super smart who spend a lot of time and energy studying exactly how this all happens. Right? What I want you to know is that a protein's shape is integrally important to its function. Right? And its shape is going to be determined by that sequence of amino acids, which amino acids they are, and how they relate to each other, and how they are attracted to or repel each other. All right. How about bonds? Okay. That's kind of cheesy. All right. <laughs> This is a little video that I think is a little bit more in-depth than the, what we need for our purposes, but if you want to go back and watch it, that's why I left the link. But the important thing is the overall structure and shape of the protein. That's what's going to determine its function. So what happens, so say I had an egg for breakfast this morning. Crack the egg, put it into a bowl first because I get shell in there all the time. Right? What is that egg white made out of? Nope, the membrane I will have opened up when I cracked it. Right? There will be a membrane in there and I open it up. Yeah, so egg white is made out of primarily a protein called albumin, right? If you've ever been like, I'm going to have an egg white omelet because it's very high in protein. It is. A protein called albumin. It's really high in protein. What happens to it? When I put, so it's clear and it's gooey, right? 
And then what happens to it when I put it in the frying pan? It turns white. And what happens to its consistency? It gets hard and it gets solid, right? So proteins, right, their structure is super important. And one way to destroy the structure of a protein is to cook it. Temperature, right? Put it on high temperature. Right? So when we cook proteins, what we're doing is we're, it's called denaturing them. We're changing their physical structure. Yeah. I can't hear you because I went to too many concerts when I was your age. Yeah. Yes, you can also denature a protein by changing the pH, right? So if I add some acid to it, it can totally change the structure of a protein, right? Or a base. Absolutely. So temperature and pH, isn't that interesting? We were talking about those earlier today. Yeah. Isn't it possible also for oils to then become acidic if you too much? Hmm. It can scorch. I don't know. I'll try to find out. Uh, well, they have fatty acid tails, and that fatty acid tails are acidic. So anytime you start breaking an oil down into its component parts, you will generate an acid. Oh, look into that. Cool. Other thoughts or questions? All right. So the interesting thing about proteins is that some of the amino acids are amino acids that we need to make proteins that we need for our body, but that our cells don't have the capacity to make from scratch. And so those are our essential amino acids. Nine out of them are essential. They're called essential because we have to eat them. That's the only way our body can get them, right? We can't create them any other way, and we need them to make the proteins that we need to be our wonderful selves, right? So this is why you have to eat protein, right? Why do I show eggs here? Any nutrition folks? So eggs are famous, so they're not only a source of a lot of protein, but they also provide you with all of the essential amino acids. Right? So all the other amino acids that you need, the ones that you can't make, are present in eggs, which is why we had this scene from the movie Rocky. <laughs> right? But now I tell you, he could have cooked them. Right? He did not have to eat the eggs raw, for those of you who've seen the movie. It's like disgusting drinking raw eggs. I mean, it's quick, so maybe that's why I did. He didn't want to take the time to fry them up in a pan. Right? So changing the shape of a protein doesn't actually change what the amino acids are. He could have, like, made an omelet. But no. All right. Eat them raw. All right. Our final category. I feel like Alex Trebek. Nucleic acid. There's two different types of nucleic acids. Quite simply, DNA and RNA. You don't need to know the full names of them, but they are deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid. All right. What do we use them for? Well, you probably know what we use DNA for, right? Yeah, those are our genes, right? So our genetic information, our instructions, basically, on how to make a human and how to create all the parts that we need and do all of the chemical reactions that we need to do. Genes that tell us if we're going to have blue eyes or brown eyes, right? All those things are made out of DNA. We also have RNA in our cells, however, and RNA is a communicator molecule that we use to communicate messages from the DNA to the rest of the cell, right? So we use RNA to communicate. And we use RNA also because an organelle of the cell called ribosomes is actually made out of RNA. So it's also a structural component of a part of the cell called the ribosomes. So we have both types of nucleic acids in human cells. The subunit for nucleic acids is the nucleotide. That's nice. They kind of like sound similar. <laughs> so it's easier to tell that they go together. All right, so it's a nucleotide. This is what a nucleotide looks like. Got a sugar, 
either deoxyribose or ribose, you have a phosphate, and then you have a base, because it is basic, it is alkaline. Right, so that's our basic structure. Didn't, didn't mean to do it, all right? But for DNA, that base could be one of four things. It could be a base called adenine, one called thymine, one called guanine, or one called cytosine. If we're talking about RNA, it's almost exactly the same, except it's either adenine, uracil, guanine, or cytosine. So a slight difference between the two. So the only difference between one nucleotide and another is which of those four bases they happen to have. Right, so did anybody see this movie? <laughs> yes, no, maybe so, a few people, right? So this movie about genetic manipulation and stuff, right? So this difference, this A, T, G, or C, this is the only thing that's different in those nucleotides that are all hooked up together to form your DNA or your RNA, right? And so you end up with these long strings of basically code, right? That's like A, T, A, G, G, C, whatever, right? Forever and forever and forever. And that code is going to translate into genetic information. Just four letters. It's kind of amazing when you think about it. All right. So how do we link subunits together? Dehydration synthesis. Absolutely. Okay. So that's like linking these two nucleotides together, right? Steal an H from one and OH from the other. Take that water out, and then you form a linkage between the two. Dehydration synthesis. RNA, we look at its structure. It's just a single strand, right? So here's our ribonucleic acid. We've got our sugar. We've got our phosphate group and the letters, which are the bases, right? So instead of a T, we have a U when we're dealing with RNA. That's what RNA looks like when you hook all the subunits together. DNA is different, however because it's a double strand. So you have just like RNA, except for T instead of U, but then you have one just opposite from it. So it's actually a double-stranded molecule. And what's cool about that is that you will form a hydrogen bond between those bases, but only in a very specific way. A and T will form hydrogen bonds with each other, and G and C will form hydrogen bonds with each other. So when they line up, we always line it up so that somebody is with their partner that they want to be with. And they form hydrogen bonds. So on the right-hand side, you can see guanine, cytosine, thymine, adenine, right? Those are the T's, the A's, and the G's, and the C's. And then we have our pentose phosphate backbone over here and the hydrogen bonds forming. Those hydrogen bonds between the two bases basically form the rungs of a ladder. So we have a ladder with hydrogen bonds between the A and T and G and C going across the middle, and then that ladder spirals and forms a helix, which you see on the left. Okay? That is the molecular structure of DNA, which Watson and Crick famously won the Nobel Prize for, although Rosalind Franklin, who was a researcher in London, was actually the first to discover it and Watson and Crick based their work off of hers. <sighs> All right, so that's DNA. Here's a prettier picture, right? That again, we kind of see that sugar phosphate backbone, and then we have those bases that line up with their partners, okay? Forming the rungs of the ladder. So that's what it looks like. We've talked about a lot of chemistry today. So we talked about ionic bonds, where an electron leaves one atom and goes to another one, creating two ions with, with opposite charges, which then are attracted to each other and stay together in an ionic bond. We talked about covalent bonds, where they agree to share electrons in joint custody, and that keeps them bonded together. And then we talked about hydrogen bonds, where you have an area of the molecule that's slightly negative because the electrons are hanging out there more, and another area that's slightly positive because the electrons are spending less time there. And then that causes these little weaker but still very important bonds between different molecules. We talked about pH, so acids, pH less than 7. The lower it is, the stronger the acid. Bases, pH greater than 7. The higher it is, the stronger the acid. Right? And they can cause molecular mayhem by stealing electrons or pushing electrons in and like totally disrupting those bonds, okay? 
So that was our first section. We talked about how our organic molecules are only formed in living things. If you look at a mountain, there will be no organic molecules there except for the ones that living things have produced, plants and animals, and microbes, bacteria, fungi, right? Everything else is just rocks and minerals. And we have subunits that are joined together by dehydration synthesis and can be split apart by hydrolysis, right? It's all about taking away a water and adding a water chemically. Carbohydrates, remember the subunit is saccharides, that little ring of carbons with OH and H on it, those are sugars, right? So saccharides are simple carbs, or the mono and disaccharides, monosaccharides like glucose and fructose, disaccharides like sucrose and lactose. Complex carbs, oh, <laughs> complex crabs, <laughs> right? They, they have issues, apparently. They're very complicated crabs. All right, so complex carbs are polysaccharides where you have more than two sugar or saccharide units linked together. So we can make glycogen, which is how we store sugars up for later in our liver. And, and uh, plants can make starches, which we love to eat because they're really good energy sources for us, and cellulose, which help the plants to stay nice and strong, but we don't like to eat them, right? So, you know, when, like when you eat lettuce and then you go to the bathroom and it, like the lettuce comes out the other, that's the cellulose, right? That's cellulose. We can't digest it. All right, lipids, four categories, fats and oils. Those are the ones we're most familiar with. Their subunits are a glycerol plus three fatty acid tails, right? So they're triglycerides, great energy source for us. And when we make fat in our body, it's for energy storage, it's for insulation, and it's for cushioning. Really important that we have enough fat. Phospholipids have that polar head. So they're unique, right, because they have an area of them that is polar. And then those fatty acid tails that are nonpolar, and they're going to make up our cell membranes. And so we're going to have some really unique properties of our cell membranes because of those phospholipids. Waxes are just kind of cool and fun. And uh, steroids, those have carbon rings as their subunit, so they're special. And we use them for hormones, right? As well as cholesterol, which is a structural component of our cell membranes. Proteins, right? Their subunit is amino acids. There's lots of different types of amino acids. And proteins do so many cool things. And the thing that determines the function that a protein can perform is it's what? Yes, it's shape, right? So it's all dependent on the shape, and the shape is dependent on the sequence of amino acids, how they relate to each other, fold in on each other, right? And make an interesting shape. Nucleic acids are made out of nucleotides that we stick together. We have DNA, which is our genetic information. And in humans, we have RNA, which is a messenger for us, as well as a structural component of ribosomes, which we'll talk more about when we talk about cells. But RNA sometimes is the genetic information for viruses. So some viruses, interestingly, use DNA, and some use RNA. SARS-CoV-2 uses RNA. They're, they don't seem to be picky. They'll do one or the other. All right. I gave you a lot of information today. Thank you for your patience and your attention. Now, we have lab supplies for you. They are in the back here. So please give me a second. And I'm going to move that cart so that on your way out, you can grab a bag. And um, there are bottles of water, which are not for you to drink, even though we care that you are hydrated. <laughs> your health is